Hi everyone, so lovely to see all of you here and uh, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome you for today's event and uh, today's event is also the last event in the semester and the year uh, of the organized by the creative writing program. It is an absolute pleasure and honor to introduce uh, Nathan Oates, but I'm not going to do the detailed introduction. What I'm going to do is very briefly tell you about who he is. We have another amazing writer who is going to introduce uh, Nathan Oates. Uh, Nathan Oates is a, a author of two books, A Flaw in the Design. It was published by Random House last year, which I read in one and a half sitting. This, the half was very, very short. Uh, it has been described as a psychological thriller by The Guardian UK, and it is truly a one. Uh, I also loved it because it is about a creative writing professor and his student um, who also lives with him because he's, they're related. But the student is doing some really creepy uh, uh, work, writing very strange stories. Um, and it is, it is an amazing novel, and I couldn't stop reading it. Um, novel has been translated to a, almost a dozen languages now. And the Japanese uh, translation came out today. Uh, it looks gorgeous. So congratulations, Nathan. He's also the, he's also the author of a short story collection. Uh, and uh, uh, it was, uh, um, he's been published in a wide range of prestigious places, such as the Missouri Review, Alaska Quarterly Review. And he was, his work was anthologized in the best American mystery stories. He has been awarded fellowships from Johns Hopkins Writing Seminars, the University of Missouri, the New York State Summer Writers Institute, the Suwannee Writers Conference, and many places. He is a professor of creative writing at uh, Seton Hall University in New Jersey and lives in Brooklyn. Uh, David Lumpkin, who is going to properly introduce Nathan Oates by talking in greater detail about his work, uh, is a writer. He's a fiction writer. He's a second year PhD student. David comes to our program with a wide range of experiences of teaching in different places, teaching for almost a decade. He lived in different countries. And he lives in Tennessee, but he also partly lives in Athens. His work has been published by uh, prestigious publications, such as The Five Points, Oxford American, and many others. Uh, and he's writing uh, working on a book of fiction here. And I am, um, I don't know why David is doing a PhD, because he's a really, really good writer. He doesn't probably need our help. But we are very happy he's here. Uh, his work is so wonderful, so redolent, and so strongly um, rooted in, in Alabama that he often writes about. He also writes about other places. But I love his Alabama stories, and his work just stands out every time. So David, my pleasure to welcome you. Thank you. OK, I've never done this before, so I don't know what I'm doing. But I asked Daruni what to do, and he said to just say what I like about the book. So that's what I'm going to do. Um, <clears throat> the synopsis on the back of Nathan Oates' book, A Flaw in the Design, describes the novel as a psychological thriller. But I was wondering, over the past couple of days, like what that really means. I know it's a genre. I looked it up on Wikipedia. It has its own Wikipedia page. Um, it blends psychological realism with all the things we expect from a thriller, like suspense and surprise, um, sometimes violence. Um, but if we forget about the genre and just think about those words, psychological thrill, I, I think we all, all of us who call ourselves writers, want to write thrillers. We want to give our readers a psychological thrill, I think, even uh, poets sometimes. Um, anyway. Uh, <laughs> A Flaw in the Design is, a, is definitely a thrilling book in uh, more ways than one. It thrilled me with mystery first and foremost. That's what hits you when you start reading it, is layers and layers of mystery. Um, there's a mystery about whether this disgustingly rich, disgustingly attractive and brilliant 17-year-old Manhattanite is actually a sociopathic villain that our protagonist, Gil, is it Duggan or Dugan? Dugan? Dugan thinks he is. Or maybe, on the other hand, he's just a spoiled orphan who doesn't know how to express his feelings. It thrills us with the mystery of whether Gil Dugan, the rich kid's uncle, is really this uh, down-to-earth father, empathetic husband, and conscientious creative writing professor that he believes himself to be, or the paranoid, delusional, borderline, suicidal waste of a writer he fears he has become. 
But the book also thrills with its craftsmanship. And this is really what excites me the most about it, is just following along how the suspense is built step by step. It never feels artificial. It just unrolls so organically. There are no cheap thrills to be found in this book. The third person limited POV is suffocating. It's like being incarcerated inside of a man's inflamed ego. <laughs> the flashbacks rush in and overtake the narrative like volcanic eruptions of repressed pain and resentment. And the cliffhangers left me hanging in such a space of unknowing that I almost couldn't help second, guess, second guessing some of the facts of my own life. This novel gives us a high definition simulation of a consciousness locked in a cage match with itself, which sounds serious, but I wanna end by pointing out just how fun and funny the book is. Gil Dugan is, in my opinion, a mirror of what a bunch of incompetent clowns our species is, just bumbling through the world, trying and usually failing to find a little truth. And here with us, hopefully willing to read a few passages, is the author of this thriller, Nathan Oates. Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction. I run a reading series, so I know how much work they are, and that was, that was your first. It's hard to believe that was your first one, because that was excellent. Thank you so much. And thank you to all of you for coming out here. Um, I, as I said, I run a series, so if it were 80 degrees in New Jersey, where I teach, in the last week of the semester, I think I would be terrified about, <laughs> will anyone be there when I show up? Um, but so I really appreciate you all coming out here on this beautiful day and on your beautiful campus. And I also want to thank Aruni for the invitation and for all of his incredible hospitality and kindness and good conversation. Um, so thanks to everyone. I'm going to read a section from the book. One of the passages I was trying to jot it down while you were um, during your introduction, the volcanic eruptions of the <laughs> backstory, which I love that description um, from the book. That's about 15 minutes. Uh, and then I thought that would leave us time for a Q&A. Um, the section I'm going to read comes from early in the book, but not the very beginning. So it probably requires a little bit of setup. Some of you, you already have some sense of what the book is about. It's about a Gill, who's a professor of creative writing. He lives in Vermont with his wife and their two daughters, who in this scene are six and nine, and in later scene, in the dramatic present of the novel are older, obviously. Um, over the years, he's become estranged from his sister, Sharon, who has married an immensely wealthy man named Niles and has a very, very badly behaved son named Matthew. And in this section of the novel that I'm going to read, Sharon and Niles have invited Gil and his family to their lavish Montauk beach house. That's out in the Hamptons at the end of Long Island, quite um, expensive part of the world. And they're there for a week in June. The house is this immense, beautiful space, and it would be a sort of perfect vacation, except for the fact that Sharon's son, Matthew, is there. And well, let's just say that he's not on his best behavior. So I think that's enough explanation, and I'll start reading. All the next day, Gil struggled to stay awake. He hadn't fallen asleep on a beach since he'd been 24 years old and had passed out on a strip of black sand in Guatemala, where he'd been traveling, purportedly trying to write, though in fact he'd spent most of his time drunk and stoned in gringo bars. He'd woken from that Guatemalan nap to find his friends gone, mosquitoes swarming over him. But now he had people to take care of. He had to make sure the girls didn't go out into the waves. He forced himself to sit up beside Molly, who lay in the umbrella shade, book open across her chest. His head throbbed, a dull, dry pulse out of sync with the crush of the surf. Each time Niles had opened a new bottle, Gil had said, sure, thanks, long after he knew he should stop. When else would he get to drink such wine? Niles was a braggart but he had impeccable taste, or a sommelier who stocked his cellar had impeccable taste, which Niles took credit for. But what did it matter when there were bottles of 2000 Valentini Multipulciano and a Latour, also from 2000, and a Latash that Niles declared something really special? 
Sharon had set the girls and Matthew up in the theater's plush leather seats before a huge screen to watch up. She let Ingrid pick the movie, and after half an hour, while they were still on salad, Matthew stomped past, saying he wasn't watching some dumb baby movie. He wasn't a baby. He hated that movie. From far off, a door slammed. As dinner wound down, Gil went to check on the girls who were huddled together with a huge container of popcorn. The nanny smiled at him from the back row, nodding to indicate everything was fine. Matthew was, thank God, nowhere to be seen. For a minute or so, he watched the screen. An ornate house floated through the sky, carried along by balloons. They'd seen this movie in the theater, but as he stepped forward to say something about that to the girls, he felt his drunkenness keenly, the wine on his breath, the pleasant dizziness, so he put a hand on the seat for balance. He probably looked drunk, at least to the nanny, so he turned back to the bright house to rejoin the adults. By the time they switched to bourbon, Gil could barely taste anything, yet he held the glass beneath his nose, swirled it, listened to the story of how rare this or that vintage was, how Niles had bought this bottle from a quirky Japanese collector who let a pack of wolves run loose on his estate, and on and on. Gil found himself saying how interesting it all was, and he stayed at the table when Molly went to put the girls to bed and Sharon excused herself soon after. It was interesting, even if made ridiculous by the nauseating sums of money paid for a few sips. But Niles wasn't a normal person, as his brutally crisp persona let you know the second you met him. He was preternaturally fit and wore elegant jeans, a white shirt, and leather shoes that looked so soft, Gil had to resist the urge to reach down and touch them. Niles's face was Hollywood-esque, Christian Bale or Viggo Mortensen, somewhere in that line, though he would only ever be cast as the malevolent male beauty, the abusive husband, the charming serial killer, the community-devouring banker. At least one of those, and hopefully not more, was a role Niles did in fact inhabit, hence this house, those wines. As the night went on and the drunkenness soaked through him, Gil realized this was the longest conversation the two of them had ever had. Maybe if he kept listening to Niles, he'd come to understand his sister, who she'd become over the past 15 years. Niles told a long story about a feud between Russian mobsters who owned neighboring Greek islands that ended up with someone getting run over by a powerboat. Niles might have been present at the accident, but this was during the bourbon portion of the night, so it was foggy. All Gil knew for sure was that Niles expected Gil to be impressed and maybe a little scared. Intimidation leached at the edges of the man's charisma. Subtle, soft, but definitely there. Not quite observable, only felt. Because actually, Niles had only did anything but polite and kind, if cool and removed, with Gil and his family. At his wedding to Sharon, most of which Niall had insisted on paying for, to the consternation and relief of Gil's parents, he'd been gracious, tearing up during the toast. And Sharon loved him, purportedly. No, she did, hopefully. Maybe Gil was just bigoted toward the rich. He assumed the worst without evidence, though the horror show that was Matthew must have its genesis somewhere. The sins of the father visited tenfold upon the son. Wasn't that in the Bible? Or it could just be his histrionic drunken stupidity. Here he was in the man's house, drinking hundreds, maybe thousands of dollars of alcohol, and he was critiquing him. Eventually, Gil begged off more drinks and staggered to bed where Molly was still up reading. Oh boy, she said, as he collapsed on the mattress beside her. You're gonna have a fun day tomorrow, sweetie. She let him sleep in, but when he woke at 10, his head felt battered, his mouth eternally parched, and a desperate need to sleep draped over him like a leaden shroud. Any attempts to free himself, such as chugging four and a half cups of coffee, only cinched it tighter about his shoulders. He thought maybe the waves would knock the hangover out of him, so he walked down to where the girls were digging for sand crabs and asked if they wanted to go in. They squealed yes and ran back to get their floaties. Frigid water tugged at his ankles and the sand slid out from beneath him, slick and traitorous. As soon as the first big wave slammed into him, he felt like he was going to barf. The grip of the water around his legs as he tried to stand, the thud of the next wave as they tried to move past the break to where they wouldn't get pummeled, it was all too much, unnatural. When a wave shoved him back, he nearly lost his grip on Ingrid, who shrieked, Daddy, and panic grabbed his throat. He had to get the fuck out of that water. 
Though her eyes were wide and frantic, hair plastered over her face, Ingrid begged him to stay in, tried to pull away as he lunged toward the receding shore. Gasping, he screamed for Chloe to come back, get out of the water now, right now, out. He staggered up and collapsed on his towel, heart heaving, head spinning. He thought he might fall asleep, but then began to worry about burning. The back of his neck was hot, as was his bald spot, as was the side of his face turned up to the sky. So he flopped onto one of the folding chairs beneath the umbrella. The seat was low, so he tried to let his head fall onto his chest. You okay there, champ? Molly said, poking his arm. She was unaffected by last night's wine. Sunglasses pushed up into her hair, so locks of it fell down around her face. The sight of her gorgeous breasts in her black suit sent a wave of lust through him, followed, weirdly, by a swell of despair that made his eyes water. Don't go in that ocean, he said, pointing at the waves as if they'd tricked him. A heavy crash nearly drowned his words. Daddy, Ingrid shouted from where she was pouting at the tide line. When can we go back in? Never, he said, just never, unless your mother wants to. Your mother most certainly does not want to. That's daddy's job, right, girls? That's right, mom, Chloe said, glaring with her arms crossed over her chest. And daddy's not doing a very good job. That's a bad ocean, Gil said, too tired to lift his arm to point, never going back. Daddy, Ingrid shouted, slapping her towel. Please, daddy. We'll swim in the pool at the house, he said. When he was a kid, he'd spend hours alone in the surf. When he was her age, he was pretty sure. Or more like Chloe's age, nine? That sounded right. But now he wasn't sure he'd let Chloe go in unattended either, as if the ocean had grown more dangerous in 30 years. Or maybe his parents had just been negligent, or his generation was a bunch of spazzes. Promise, Ingrid said, throwing a fistful of sand at the waves. I promise, he said, when we go back after lunch. We all heard him, Molly said. A deal has been struck. They lapsed into quiet, everyone reading or watching the ocean for 15 minutes. Then Chloe and Ingrid asked if they could take a walk, and Molly said she'd go with him. They wanted to see how far down it was to the next house, its white turret rising above the dunes. Left alone, he tried to nap, but again failed. This place, this beach, the house, the privacy. There was another family so far down the sand. There were specks. It was excessive. And yet, there he was. God, it was beautiful. What was the alternative? Refuse to come? Not see his sister? Lecture her about the evils of her husband's work in finance? About a di with a digression into the fact that her son needed intensive therapy, shock therapy, possibly a lobotomy? <laughs> the, the girls returned from their walk and took the chairs down to the surf and let the waves wash around their legs, squealing when the swells lifted them. Gil expected his sister to come down, but by lunch she hadn't, so they went back to the house for a break from the sun. The house was empty. The cook, already in the kitchen, said he'd bring them lunch, so they went out onto the deck and played Uno beneath a table umbrella. Sandwiches arrived with a bowl of chips and another of fresh vegetables and a pitcher of lemonade with chilled glasses. They played until Ingrid lost too many hands in a row and quit, which Molly said was the international sign for siesta. Daddy, the pool, Ingrid said, tugging his arm, still angry about the cards. Siesta, he moaned. You promised, Daddy, Ingrid whined. You sure did, Molly said, standing up and stretching. Have fun at the pool, you two. Well, he could nap later, presumably, and the lemonade had burned away the worst jabs of his hangover. The pool was now half in shade, but it was warm, and they played basketball in the hoop at the shallow end. Ingrid flailed wildly any time she went too deep, immediately given in to panic, so he had to scoop her up and calm her down. He wasn't sure why she had so much trouble learning to swim. Chloe, by the time she was six, had been doing laps, or maybe she'd been more like eight. He knew bringing it up would sound like criticism, so he withheld the lecture about how she needed to relax, float, don't fight. They played for an hour, and when he begged for a break, she surprisingly relented. He pulled a lounge chair into the shade and told Ingrid to stay away from the pool. She sat at a nearby glass table, coloring in the books they'd bought, his good girl. And then he must have fallen asleep. He hadn't meant to, a mistake, to fall asleep with his kid beside the pool. Why hadn't he sent her inside or gone to nap in the air conditioning? The splash might have woken him, though he didn't remember hearing it. He sat up sharply, blinking, his heart pounding. Matthew, 
in a gray t-shirt and black shorts stood at the edge of the pool looking down into the water. And for a moment, Gil watched the boy, uncertain if he was in a dream. Matthew, Gil said. The boy didn't turn, and then Gil thought to look for Ingrid. She wasn't there. She could be playing somewhere. He couldn't see behind the lounger or in the cover of the bushes at the edge of the yard. But when he stood, he saw the shaking of the water settling down after some agitation, and then beneath the surface, Ingrid, not swimming, down at the bottom of the pool. He screamed her name and stepped past Matthew, who flinched away from him as if his uncle were being a brute. Gil caught only a tiny glimpse of the boy's face, his sneer, or he'd think later, his smirk, and flung himself into the deep end. Water sloshed and froth, and for a few seconds he thought he might be drowning, but he thought, Ingrid, tipping himself down, he dived to the bottom of the pool where she was suspended, eyes open, watching him approach. He got his arms under, around her chest and pushed off the bottom with both feet and surged to the surface. Flailing and sputtering, he told her, he pulled her to the edge, telling her to hold on, grab the edge. Jesus, honey, grab the edge. And though her face was bluish, she put a limp hand on the side and he heaved her from the water, then pulled himself out and rolled her onto her side and put his arms around her stomach and tugged so she vomited onto the soaked gray stones. Ingrid, are you okay? Honey, answer me, he yelled, right in her face, turning her around. She blubbered, her brow crumpling, and began to cry. Molly found them like that, Ingrid sobbing against his chest when she shouted, when she shouted, what's wrong? What happened? She hurt Gil. Jesus, what happened? He could only stare in stupid incomprehension and say she was fine. She was fine. He had her. She was okay. Just scared. But Molly, he would think later, already understood better than he did. Probably understood as soon as she'd heard him scream Ingrid's name. Certainly did when she saw them beside the pool understood that with a small twist, their lives could have been shattered. Molly dropped to her knees and pulled Ingrid from his arms and carried her away to one of the lounge chairs, away from the water that quivered and shook as if reaching for them, for the one it had meant to claim. Ingrid was incoherent, unable to explain. She seemed uninjured, but maybe she'd been submerged long enough to damage her brain. Gil's frantic internet searches while Molly soothed the hiccuping girl on the bed were no help, since he had no idea how long she'd been underwater. I don't, I don't, I don't, Ingrid kept saying each time Gil pressed her, and eventually Molly threw up her hand to silence him and gave the girl an iPad and put on an episode of Phineas and Ferb. Ingrid settled into the pillows, damp hair clumped around her shoulders, eyes puffy from crying, lips a bit blue, or well, that could just be the reflected glow of the screen. Chloe cuddled next to her sister, close enough that Ingrid put a hand on her sister's leg, like she used to do when she was a baby. Molly led him across the room and said, Gil, what happened? I fell asleep, he said, knowing there was no point in hiding it. And as he feared, loathing flashed across his wife's face. She hated him in that moment, and he deserved it. I fell asleep and she was playing, but not by the water. I told her to stay away from the water, but I woke up she was in the pool and I jumped in and I pulled her out and I think she's okay, right? Isn't she okay? How can she be okay? She almost drowned, Molly cried. Chloe scooted closer and put an arm around Ingrid who let her head fall onto her sister's shoulder. Matthew was there, he said, by the pool when I woke up. What, Molly said, when I woke up, he was just standing by the pool. I mean, he was looking down at Ingrid, just standing there. So what are you saying, Gil? Are you saying, Matthew, that he had something? She gestured at the door. I don't know, Molly. I didn't ask him. And by the time I got Ingrid out of the water, he was gone. But Molly was right. And the thought had flickered through his panicked brain as well. Matthew standing by the pool, Ingrid in the pool. He'd done something. Somehow, surely, Matthew was to blame. Molly squinted at him, then opened the door and asked Chloe to pause the show. Ingrid said, no, what are you doing? It's not over. Honey, I know, but can you first tell us what happened? Molly said, sitting down beside the girl on the bed. Gil stood behind, banished by guilt. I want to show, Ingrid whined, slapping the pillow. Just tell us what happened, honey. How did you fall in? I didn't fall, Ingrid said, as if they were being intentionally dumb. What do you mean, honey? What happened? Ingrid let out a sigh, rolled her eyes, and said, I was playing and Matthew came outside while daddy was sleeping and he pushed me in the pool. She said it as if it was nothing 
as if they should have known, stupids. What Gil felt was something he'd never tell anyone, a thrill. He'd been right. Matthew was to blame, not Gil. Well, he'd still fallen asleep, but his daughter had nearly drowned because he was negligent. She'd nearly drowned because of her evil fucking cousin. So I'll stop there. <laughs>